Okay, so following on from that, I'd like to introduce Professor van der Velt, who is a Professor of Surgical Oncology at Leiden University Medical Center. And he's going to be talking to us about clinical applications of image-guided cancer surgery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jochen, Michel, uh, the audience further, but now on tumor-specific fluorescence guidance surgery. And um, of course, completeness of surgery is an important prognostic factor. Prevention of positive margins and minimizing residual tumor will improve individual patient outcomes. Intraoperative identification of tumor tissue is difficult. Inspection and palpation not always sufficient, especially in laparoscopic and robotic surgery. Need for intraoperative modalities can identify tumor tissue with high sensitivity and specificity, improving intraoperative tumor tackling by targeting tumor specific receptors is my topic. And this clearly indicates how we can use this uh, technique by better seeing, you can better operate. Fluorescent imaging, as it has been discussed already in part, real-time intraoperative, invisible for the naked eye, relatively high tissue penetration, but not deeper than 10 millimeters, also in the liver, obviously. It's simple fluorescent tracer with a camera system. You inject the contrast agent. You have two cameras, the near-infrared and the color camera, and you merge them together, and then you can see better. What has been discussed is endocyanine green and methylene blue, but the novel contrast agents indicate vital structures, but specifically tumor-specific contrast agents can change your operative strategy. We have a unique situation in Leiden that we have GMP production at site. The Centrum for Human Drug Research is there with the preclinical phase studies, tumor specificity, toxicology, then the safety and pharmacokinetics, and then the first in patients dosing and timing optimization. EPCOM was the first in human study, the epithelial cell adhesion molecule, transmembrane protein with interaction and adhesion upregulated in adenocarcinomas, can, is, has been used for gastric, pancreatic, colorectal, and prostate. First studies on healthy volunteers, then in patients, colorectal, esophageal, and gastric cancer. And you see the cohorts of the different studies. So dosing is important, six milligrams, 18 milligrams, timing intravenously, three to six days before surgery. And there you can see, in the, indeed, intraoperatively, the tumor localization. Then what was already mentioned by Rule. ZW800 for ureter imaging, developed by Curadel, and we have GMP production, LUMC, renal clearance, first healthy volunteers, and then 12 patients, no toxicity, and injection during the procedure. After two to 10 millions, you get a signal, visible using clinically available camera systems. And it is measurable up to 48 hours with a signal to background peak after two hours. And here, again, you saw it before, eight minutes and 45 minutes, you see clearly the imaging of the ureter. And that has been published in Nature Communications this year by the Falk. We have the synthesis of the protein synthesis in our own facility with purification and then ready for intravenous application. It's a cyclic pent up Peptide conjugated to ZW800 binds to endogreens associated with neoangiogenesis. So we have preclinical healthy volunteers and thereafter in patients. Preclinical data in pancreatic carcinoma, tongue carcinoma, and colon carcinoma in nude mice, and you see a clear signal there. So it works in this, and the first results of cyclic RGD uh, in pathology and in the PEARL method. A phase two study was performed with SGM101. It's an anti-CEA antibody, and it works without necessity of elevated blood serum CEA. It was used in a study in uh, my unit and the Katerina Hospital in Eindhoven, dose escalation, primary colorectal cancer, and an additional cohort of 70 patients with recurrent colorectal cancer and high-back procedure that was published in Lancet Gastroenterology last year. 
So SGM-101 binds to tumor cells without necessarily elevated uh, CEA levels in the serum. And this was an important study, also published in Lancet Gastroenterology. 44 additional malignant lesions were only visible with fluorescence. In 35% patient, there was a change in management perioperatively. Additional resections, change in intraoperative radiotherapy planning, and there was no resection when it was clinical suspect with no fluorescent signal and frozen section indicated no tumor. And in more than 75 patients without related adverse events. And here you see some examples with high back procedures. On the left side, the normal picture, the overlay on the right side, and especially in the omentum and the mesentery, you see the, the lesions clearly, and in the ovary, it's already clinically evident. But uh, in the high back procedure, you have to operate all the green light away. And ex vivo pathology, you also see here in the center of the tumor. And uh, you also, it is visible when you use this by pathology, and you can check it, of, of course, also on a biopsy. Lateral lymph nodes, still a very important clinical problem, uh, whether to resect or not when suspicious on MRI. But here with intravenous SGM, you can see there's clearly positive nodes in the lateral space, so these nodes need to be resected. And uh, usually they are already when they're indicated preoperatively on the MRI, but when they're still uh, uh, positive, then you can resect it either open or laparoscopic nowadays. So the phase one study indicated that it is safe, it's suitable for detection of primary and recurrent colorectal cancer, it indicates malignant lymph nodes, liver and peritoneal metastasis, identification of additional lesions, and distinguishing malignant from benign tissue, which is important when I, what I discuss later on. Now there is ongoing an international randomized clinical trial, T4 colon, T3, 4 rectal, locally recurrent colorectal cancer and HIPAC procedures, with a total of 300 patients, and uh, light inspection, you see there's not a one-to-one -one randomization. 230 patients will receive the SGM-101, and 60 patients will not receive, so it, that is the more or less placebo part with an unblinding of the surgeon at the moment of operation. So the primary endpoint is the proportion of patients with at least one additional lesion found with fluorescence, expected more than 5%, and there are a number of participating centers already, <coughs> and that is global, so also in the US participating centers. And as this moment in time, there's more than 40 inclusions, so the study is ongoing. Then there is another study, a multi-cohort study in the Netherlands, locally advanced recurrent rectal carcinoma, R0 resection, secondary endpoint change in surgical plan preoperatively as found in the phase 1-2 uh, study. And here you see now what kind of substances targeted we have for pancreas, gastric esophageal, colorectal, lung, prostate, ovarian, liver, endometriosis, and there is, of course, what this was discussed in the previous talks, the perfusion of the anastomosis. I will only briefly talk about this avoid trial, anastomotic leakage, and value of endocyanine green and decreasing leakage rate, multicenter trial, laparoscopic, and uh, primary endpoint is clinical relevant anastomotic leakage after uh, 90 days. And here are the operative measures, but that has been discussed in the previous talk. Briefly then about the watch and wait and non-operative strategy, where this can also play an important role. We published last year in the Lancet results of a study of over 1,000 patients with a two-year actual rate of local regrowth of 25%, and amazing was that 97% was within the bowel, so nodal uh, metastases were very scarce. And when there was a regrowth, the majority of patients, 93.5, with a data collection ongoing, had an R0 resection. 
in these cases, it is very important because the clinically observed uh, complete uh, uh, remission rate versus the PCR, the pathologic complete resection rate, differ because there's often scar tissue and other indications that there might still be tumor and fluorescent endoscopy for response evaluation after induction therapy, therefore, is very important to discriminate that without performing a local resection which has a high complication and a dehiscence rate because of the previous radiation therapy. So we know that about, in the, from the literature, 20 to 25 percent of high-risk patients treated with chemoradiation therapy have a pathological complete response, and this we can enhance, perhaps, by this evaluation. It has been 10 years that Lars Palman, for the first time here, presented the design of the RAPIDO trial. And the tr RAPIDO trial was completed successfully, and the RAPIDO trial was in locally advanced rectal cancer. We randomized 920 patients to two arms, standard radiation therapy, with combined with capsitabine, and the other short-term 5 times 5 gray, which was used also in the TME trial, followed by 6 KPOX, and there you have your surgery at more than four months, so an enormous delay, which showed also from the Swedish uh, study that it is safe to uh, delay surgery <coughs> in the experimental arm. So the update is that 459 patients had the uh, radiation therapy followed by the chemotherapy, and 442 had the standard uh, uh, arm. I must say we are still five patients short of the final analysis, so I cannot present the final analysis. They will be expected in the next one to two months, but you can see that compliance of preoperative treatment is in both arms was very good. The radiation, the short-term radiation therapy was even 100 percent. Post-operative chemotherapy is as low as always, only 50 percent, 51 percent compliance. So uh, in the Netherlands, it's not standard of care. And the post-operative complications in both arms was the same. This is very, and, and here you can see that the curative surgery was insignificantly higher with radiation therapy followed by chemotherapy. And we found in the experimental arm now 28% pathologic complete responses as opposed to 12% in the standard arm. And this you may not see really, but you see that there's significantly less distant metastasis after preoperative chemotherapy. But extensive analysis are currently underway, <clears throat> and, to, and in this study, non-operative strategy was a, a, a protocol violation, so everybody had to be operated. Only 3% of patients were not operated, and, uh, but we have to be aware that we should identify those patients who have a pathologic complete response by selecting them, and there also this uh, fluorescent imaging can help. The future in fluorescent guided surgery is difficult because you have these different imaging devices, you have imaging agents, a lot of imaging agents, you have different patients, and then you have regulations complying to all of these. And even in a clinical trial, it's more important because for the clinical trial, you also have a lot of bureaucracy, and then you have to really fix the imaging devices and the imaging agents because a lot of these agents peak at a different level, a nano level for fluorescence. So who benefits of image-guided surgery? Recurrent disease and our previous surgery in the same area, because it's difficult to distinguish between scar tissue and malignant tissue. Disseminated and metastasized disease also with non-targeted uh, agents in order to find all additional spots. The surgical procedure in or close to a vital organ, because less potential yet organic damage to vital structures. Procedures with known high percentage of positive resection margins, for instance, also in pancreatic cancer. Better intraoperative judgment of resection margins because you can clearly see the, the, the limits and extension of the tumor. 
Neoadjuvant treated patients, more and more gastrointestinal patients are treated with neoadjuvant treatment. And it's difficult to identify the tumor because of scar tissue and the most likely shrinkage of the tumor. And this is getting more and more in all kinds of tumors. And then, of course, you have the, have the selection for a watch and wait procedure, which may play a very important discrimination by using endoscopes uh, to discriminate between t scar tissue and tumor tissue. And then less saw the tumors and carcinoma in city because it's difficult to identify the tumor because they most often feel like healthy tissue. So this is the whole group in Leiden that works on this, CHDR, and together with the LUMC. And now we have expanded not only with national studies, but also with international studies to prove the value of targeted imaging. And I think it has a very sound future. Thank you very much for your attention.